Hey now, it's Brace for Impact, and I'm your host, Mike Gilbert, and I'm joined as always by JD by Gotta Leave It. How you doing, JD? I'm fine. How are you? Doing good, man. Doing good. I uh, had uh, had kind of a cool week here. Lots of stuff going on in uh, where I'm at. Um, but uh, had a lot of fun this week. Uh, watched some pretty good wrestling. Not not much tonight, but I've watched <laughs> since uh, last weekend. I've watched some pretty good wrestling. Uh, so I would say mostly all is well in the professional wrestling world. That's good. I'm uh, I'm off work tomorrow. I'm pretty happy about that. But I got a freelance gig. I'm shooting the um junior high state tournament because wrestling never ends amateur wrestling that is and uh (laughs) so yeah that's what i got going on pretty excited i get to sleep in a little bit tomorrow thrilled yeah man yeah man well there's you know there's a lot impact actually has some news so i want to just go ahead and get right to the top of the impact let's go uh, as we get started nothing really breaking because the story broke uh like pretty much shortly after we went off the air last week but we'll go ahead and talk about it so uh taya valkyrie um of the death dolls uh, she basically, she finished up at the, uh, at the impact tapings in Las Vegas, man. She's been around for about a year. You know, she was around for a couple years and then she was, she was the champion for a really long time. I think she had like a 10 to 12 month title reign. She lost her belt to Tessa Blanchard and then she hung out for a little bit. She ended up going to WWE where that just didn't work out as the Frankie Monet character. They changed her name for God knows why. Um, they do. That, yeah, that's just what they do. Um, and then um, she came back, and she's had a decent little run. They they gave her the title match against uh, Deanna Perrazzo at uh, Rebellion last year, um, but has mostly just been in a tag team with the Death Dolls ever since then, doing skits and tag team matches. So, yeah, it looks like she's on her way out, man. So you could have had that and said Death Dolls done, mm. right? Or Dead End Death Dolls. So you could have done that instead of Ty finishing the impact. You know, yeah. we're, new with, we're new with this, so I'm going to cut you some slack. Uh well, and to be fair, Taya's done. That doesn't mean that Jessica Havoc and Rosemary are done. They could still continue the Death Dolls tag Yeah, it's, it won't be as fun without Taya. No. <laughs> no. Taya's the glue that kind of holds it together. Um, So she's moving on from the... She went to this... Remember last time, she left for the uh, Stanford Supermax? <laughs> yes, yes. That's so, she shot Johnny Bravo. I'm going to assume that she's headed for Jacksonville State Penitentiary this time around. Uh, you know what? I would I would say Orlando Penitentiary. Um, and what I mean by Orlando, they tape Ring of Honor there. That would be my uh, guess. I, um, I think that she could actually make more of a difference in Ring of Honor than she could at uh, AEW. I agree with you, but there is no difference yeah. right now. Let's be real. No. And I don't know if you watched Dynamite this week, but Jade Cargill challenged the best Canada had to offer. Uh, Taya. Taya is yeah. Canadian. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Canadian actually... fans sure love Canadian wrestlers. Yeah. You know, that, that actually really makes sense. I mean, she is technically Canadian. Like, I don't know if they could test her blood and it shows Canadian, but she was definitely born and raised there. But let's be honest, like she's made her name in the States and in Mexico. I, I, I keep forgetting she's Canadian. I, so was she ever Chris like Jericho? I know, but but at least Chris Jericho like worked the Canadian Indies for a long time. I think Taya it's true. almost started her career in the States, right? I, I know would she think did, so. she, she trained with Lance. I know she trained with Lance um at his school, I'm pretty sure. I mean, that's a Canadian pedigree in and of itself, right? You yeah. train with Lance Storm. So yeah. I'm gonna assume that they're gonna bring her in. I mean, it's possible. It's possible she beats Jade Cargo. Right, because that story yeah. is at a dead freaking end, and no one cares anymore. No, well, it, the, it just went on too long, and they <laughs> they didn't. Long? So with Cargill, they never really added any new layers to the her character. I think they were trying to do something with that idiot Bow Wow, but that fell through. That fell and through. Now, and now she's just got you know she's got the baddies, and you know that, and she beats people up, and that's about it. And the baddies she are gone. Doesn't even have the baddies anymore. She just has Layla yeah. Gray. I mean, just like she's a limited character. There's still like they've kind of probably pushed her too hard too soon. And like, Mm -hmm. I mean, unless you're ready to beat her and quite frankly, she's not really ready to sell. So, I mean, like, what do you do? Like, I I mean, like, I get why they did what they did, but now you're in a now you're in a pickle. Now, what do you do? I say give it to Ty. It's something different. Yeah, you know, but you said you said Jade Cargill isn't ready to sell yet. I mean, she's been wrestling for a couple of years now. 
but yeah, she's still she, bad at it, though. Yeah, I know, <laughs> like, but and it and and whose fault is that? It's it's hers because you know what? She's not out there taking indie dates trying to get better. Man, I've she said works this once a, a week. Times. I've said this once a week if you're lucky. When's the last time she had yeah. a match? She's lucky if she has a match a month. I've said this before. The flaw in AEW system. This is why I get mad at people online because I've I've come to learn, Mike, that I just hate wrestling Twitter because <laughs> everyone's dumb. I hate all of the people. I hate everybody. I hate my friends. Like I hate. <laughs> <laughs> like this is where we're at. No, like I mean, these people going like, "Oh, AEW can't have house shows. They'll get hurt. It'll be terrible." Uh, and I'm like, "Everyone sucks. Like everyone hit. Not everyone sucks. That's an overstatement on my part. Yeah. Like there's there's people that have hit a certain plateau. People like Jungle Boy have gotten a lot better because he works all the time, right mm-hmm. on the show. And then there's people that haven't gotten better." Right. And how do you get better? Like Sky Blue, I mean, like, I don't think she's great either, but she works every godforsaken indie in the world. Right. Yeah. She's working hard, trying to get better. I can't say that for lots of talent there. I can't. Mm-hmm. Like, so a lot of them sign contracts and, like, don't show up anywhere else. Like, Mike Bennett is everywhere. Mike, if you have an indie show and, like, you're willing to book Mike Bennett, he will fly there and he will do whatever. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. That dude is a hustler and a grinder. Nothing but respect. I can't say that for everybody on that show. Right. There's a lot of lazy people in that locker room. And I'm not saying Jade's lazy, but I'm saying she hasn't taken bookings anywhere else and hasn't gotten better. Yeah. Yeah. She, she hasn't gotten better. And I don't want to go like name names and, you know, trash the AEW roster, you know, especially because we got an impact roster that was struggling a bit tonight. Oh boy, um, did we ever. Yeah, you know, we 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 have we have uh we gotta clean up our own side of the street over here. Um, but real quick, uh, you know, Justin's popped in the green room. Uh, oh fuck it, we'll just we'll Let's bring him it. on in a minute. I just want to do some uh, quick quick hits since we already started talking the news. So Justin, just hang out. Um just some quick announcements. Eddie Edwards has re-signed with impact, no terms, no no, uh, no news on how long that deal is, but uh, look, Eddie, Eddie's a lifer here. He's not going to mm-hmm. go anywhere. Every time his contract is up, I just assume they're just going to renew it. He seems to be pretty happy and content. The guy is having fun. He's eating carbs. You can tell that he wrestles with a t-shirt on. He's got no ambition outside of impact, but he, to his credit, is still out there hustling the indie scene. He's out there. Yes, he's he him is. and David Richards are still. Uh, and more on David Richards later, but he's he's still out there. Him and Richards are a tag team again, so he's still out there grinding. But he's he's just happy with Impact, man. He's earned it though. Like that guy, yeah. that guy did the indie scene hard for years. <clears throat> Excuse me, for years, right? Honing his craft, becoming a tag team that was quite frankly probably too ahead of its time, right? And yeah. like now he's older. He's probably what mid 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 to late thirties at this point, right? Uh, he's close to forty. He's got to be a Okay, yeah, so that's fine. He's found a spot that he's comfortable in. They love him. He's great on the show. He's one of the few consistent performers who's good always, no matter what they give him. Eddie Edwards does great. Good for him. I'm happy they signed him. Makes my television watching better every week that that Eddie Edwards is on the show in some fashion. Yeah, and people say he's like the heart and soul of, of Impact, and that kind of you know that's the name they gave to him because Tommy Dreamer was you know they were trying to turn him into the new Tommy Dreamer. I wasn't a fan but, of that. I wasn't a fan of that. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, but he, I there is something to that. Like he is the constant, yes. right? He is the like he was from the TNA days. He's been there ever since. He was the world champion, the X division champion. He's been a multiple time tag team champion. Um, he does hardcore matches. He does technical wrestling matches. He does like uh, awesome, awesome main event level matches. He can also be on your opening match. The guy can do it all for this company. And he also does kind of like mini movies where he's fighting PCO in the desert. He could do that shit too. So he's kind of like a, a an all purpose tool for, for impact. Um, and he's not like, if you put him on something, he's never really going to let you down. Like he's a consistently really good performer. You know who he reminds me of? This is going to sound weird, but I'm going to let me sell my case on this. Tito Santana. Okay. Tito Santana yeah, so- did everything in that company. Yes. Like from like 83 to 93 for a good decade, Tito Santana, whether he, and there were times he was the main event when he was the intercontinental champion, him and Randy Savage sold out arenas, right? Mm-hmm. When they were running WWB shows. And that's back when they were running C and C plus shows, right? That dude was not only that, but he was also booking the shows in 86. Right. And then he would also go on tag team Rick Martel. And then he would have like a low run later on as the El Matador. Where he was basically, uh, you know, 
lower mid card guy to prelim guy, right? He did everything in that company. Now, granted, Eddie Edwards done on a bigger stage and impact, but it's also impact, and he wasn't, you know, vying for position against Hulk Hogan. So, <laughs> yeah. but that's what I mean by like a guy who has just done everything in the company, but it's pretty loyal and sticking around. So, yeah, I'm happy. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then just two more things before we bring on Justin. Um, just signed for the Multiverse United <clears throat> show with New Japan as a six way scramble for the X Division title. We got uh, Trey Miguel, Rich Swan, Frankie Kazarian, uh, Clark Connors, um, Kevin, yeah, Kevin Knight, and uh, Rocky Romero. They're they're going to vie for the X Division title. And this one threw me off guard. Um, and we'll we'll bring we'll bring Justin in for this one. This one threw me off guard, man. But uh, it's uh, Kenta versus Minoru Suzuki. And um, as you can imagine, why that would throw me off guard is because that is not an Impact versus New Japan match on an Impact versus New Japan show. What the hell is up with that? I don't know. Ask New Japan. Yeah, All these, yeah. I feel like I'm watching New Japan strong with better production. Yeah, uh, sometimes. sometimes. Well, I th- there was a tag match. It was, I mean, this, it was a great match. It was like Motor City Machine Guns and Chris Bay and um, Ace Austin. Ace Austin. I mean, they're all great, but to me, they're they're the New Japan guys. You're not wrong. Although and this is what happened. I mean, it's not the same exact scenario, but it reminds me of when ROH would just book all the New Japan guys and everybody would be tuning in to New Japan or to ROH, but it was kind of for New Japan. You know what I mean? To be fair, the Motor City Machine Guns were born, bred, and have had their greatest success. That's different. They They are are impact guys. They are an impact team, right? Although they do have some ROH pedigree themselves. Like, so they were a new, they were a, a team from here in impact that was, brought in too strong because you know they fit in perfectly and can work with anybody and they're great but the yeah. thing is is like they they have the new japan titles <laughs> that that they makes it feel that. like a new japan <laughs> i mean even the two guys i mean those two are probably the two prime candidates for when you think impact tna i mean those guys mm-hmm. were oh not always they still are like top dudes yeah, they rule and and you want to associate with them with the company but if new japan insists I don't know. Well, hey. I, I would I would say because Chris Saban is an employee of of Impact, um, I think Motor City Machine Guns going to New Japan is more of kind of like an Impact sending their people to New Japan versus the the former, right? They, see, they are I going see. there to they they are absolutely now. Alex Shelley is just a freelance guy who just happens to be close friends with Saban, but Chris Saban himself is not only a contracted talent here. He's also an employee here. He's a road agent. He's a producer. He's all those things for his office. Impact. He's, he's, he's office. So that, that is just them, you know, trying to, to bridge the gap with, with new Japan and, and intermingle. Is it a little bit too much? I mean, it hasn't really done anything for ratings. Uh, does it do anything for ticket sales? Not really because they're not really bringing in the top new Japan guys. You know, um, if they brought in the big, the big guns, maybe that would do something, but it, 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 it really doesn't. So it's just kind of like, you know, Impact didn't have a whole lot of talent. New Japan Jay, strong. New Japan so strong didn't have a whole lot of talent. You know, so Jay White just last year. Yeah, that is true. They did. Yeah, they they awesome. did. All right, let's go to the uh, the BTI pre-show. Uh, Frankie Kazarian and Rich Swan defeated Raw Shing and Shira, just as Justin Nipper said, and that was talking BTI. Thank you, folks. Thank you for talking BTI with us. Cool. Now let's get to the main card. Uh, a recap aired of the Exxon Bullet Club and Motor City Machine Guns main event from last week, which was very excellent. Uh, great, great, great match. Uh, and then uh, Bulky Ray came out for a promo. <laughs> say, say whatever we want about Bully Ray. The, the crowd was into it. Mike Gilbert was not into it, but the audience there in Las Vegas was into into his uh, – into his, he's a good heel. He always has been. Mm-hmm. That's a good promo. Um, yeah, but he's talking about what he did to to Tommy Dreamer at No Surrender. He claimed we all saw social media after No Surrender with Tommy challenging Ray to a busted open match. Uh, Ray said the challenge was empty because the doctors told him he couldn't compete and there was no way this match was going to happen. That is not what the doctors told him. Last week, the doctor said he was going to be just fine. Um, Santilla, Santina Morella came out. Uh, is, and nobody is a really busted cared. open match where, th- where three octogenarians bullshitting about a boring thing for 90 minutes? Uh, God, I hope not. I'm hoping it's a first blood match. Um, <laughs> could you imagine John Moxley in a first blood match? He would have no, no he'd lose. 
See, you no, know, that's a problem. See, if someone was smart on that show, they would say, I'm going to challenge you to a first blood match because I know if you walk to the ring, you're going to bleed immediately. That'd be great. I don't know why nobody has thought of that in AEW. Uh, it's some heel, right some, there. Yeah, some heel has to do it. Come on, guys. Uh, yes. But yeah, Morella came out to basically no reaction. Um, but then called uh, Bully Ray Bobby Ray, which pissed off Bully Ray. And then we got a Bobby Ray chant from the crowd, kind of like the Ass Boy stuff in, uh, in AEW. And then B- Bupinder Gujar came out and nobody fucking cared. Nope. Cut a, cut a promo in Hindi and then Santino made a match for right then and there. So, uh, and then Gujar ended up winning because uh, Bully Ray hit him with the low bro. So, there you go, man. Um, <laughs> not Not a good start to say the least. Nope. Nope. <laughs> I, you, uh, you said it, man. That's the show. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it wasn't. Look, this, this was, d- despite Bully being a pretty good heel, this was just not, not good. Um, after the match, Ray went to beat down Gujar, but uh, Tommy Dreamer ran down to make the save. And as Dreamer was going for the Death Valley driver, Masha Slamovich gave him the low blow to Dreamer. And then Mickey James ran down to attack Slamovich. And then Dreamer's. So Bully Ray actually wrapped the chain around Mickey's neck which look, looked violent, by the way, and just pulled her up. And um, But um, Dreamer made the save and uh, chased uh, Bully Ray out. So it looks like we'll be getting a mixed tag match coming up. I hope Bully Ray is working with some of these Impact guys in their promos because I think there is something to learn. The man is really good at channeling his rage, internal or whatever, or putting it on, mm-hmm. I'm not sure which it is, and like focusing it into his character and, and his motivations and stuff like that. Like, he's really good. I mean, like, I'm not a fan of his wrestling at this stage of his life. Man's in great shape. Not going to take that away from yep. him. Cannot say anything bad about his promo work. He's still nope. awesome at it. Probably he better. He's probably better now as a promo than he was in the 90s, back when he would just, like, goad the crowd into being really <laughs> mad at him. Like yeah, now I feel well, like he actually tells like stories with his promos. I really do feel like he's one of the better promo guys in the game right now. Well, well, back then, like he would just say the most awful shit to get the crowd riled up, and he now crawl. he has to be more creative, right? Yes, he would call the crowd f word, the f word, like the, yes. the three letter f word, not the four letter f word, <laughs> right. and like he would just like berate them and then just get them really, and it worked because it was the ECW yeah. crowd. So it was a bunch of freaking lunatics to begin with. And like, it worked, man. Those ECW crowds with the Dudley, that version of the Dudley boys could be spooky. Like, and it is, it's a different world now. And I do think he's a joke. Ju- Unlike a lot of guys from that particular era who just complain that it's not the same. Bully Ray has actually adjusted, moved on and evolved his character pretty consistently over the years. So yeah, I don't enjoy watching him wrestle, but I do like listening to him talk. I do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I just wish he would switch the gear up a little bit. Like gears that, a little like, played out, man. I'll give you that. Gears a little played well, they, out. They on Twitter, they they always do the flashback to when uh Bully and uh, Devon powerbomb Dixie through the table. And it was a great moment in Impact History. I get it. And he's wearing the same damn t- 5150 t shirt that he kind of wears now mm-hmm. with basketball shorts. And I'm just like, come on, bro. Like I, if Bully has evolved his character, but he's not evolved his gear, he should really call up Chris Jericho. Like, hey, do you got any ideas on some gear changes? Because I I need something different. Because he went from the tie dye, right? And mm-hmm. then they got the WWE, and they went to the the camo, the camo, yeah, which is essentially a rip off of New Jack. But they they yeah. did that, and then and then they brought that same gear uh, to to TNA, and then when he went on his own, he became the bully Ray guy. And he had just a hardcore 5150 shirt and like a hockey Jersey and, and basketball shorts. He's kind of like a public enemy almost. So I never thought about that before. That is kind of what his yeah. gear is very much I, like. Yeah. I just, I'm just like, look, if, if it reminds me of the dying days of TNA, that's not a good thing. So I'm like, like change it up a little bit, at least the, the, the look of your, mm-hmm. of your gear. But I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, PCO was in the desert screaming about Eddie Edwards and he said Eddie Edwards couldn't kill the monster and he wanted to fight. Um, I like PCO. This was cheesy as hell, but I just like PCO. So I like this. Um, He's a perfect fit for this promotion. He's a perfect fit for this promotion. I've been saying it for a year now. You know, I just thought it would be great. PCO versus Yoshiki Inamura. That would be great. Yeah, that would that would be that would be freaking awesome. I would like to speak that into existence. Who would you put PCO against in the, for the New Japan show, Multiverse United? I think that's going to be a curious thing. Like, who would fit 
the PCO mold. So there's not a lot of monsters in New Japan right now, right? Like they don't have right that guy. The only guy they have that's close to a monster is like five that's, foot four, and it's yeah, Ishii. <laughs> I feel like they put Ishii. That's almost like too easy. I feel like they put Ishii yeah. against everybody, and I feel like yeah. I need someone who's a little bit more like big and dynamic. But we don't have like oh Jeff Cobb. Cobb's wrestling moose. But I still would do that. That's who I would put. You said, who would you put? Yeah, I, would okay. put I would put <laughs> Jeff Cobb. Okay. Uh, you know, what? I'll, I'm going to say Togi Makabe. There you go. Blast Togi him. Makabe? He's going to die. Like I know, but he he wears a chain around and he does the whole bruiser Brody thing. So he's got a yeah. little bit of crazy in him. He does, but his like, he can't move. Like Togi Makabe no. 10 years ago, that would have been fun. Togi <laughs> Makabe now is like a shell of his former self. We're going to go there. You know, it'd be fun, actually. Kojima. Okay. Yeah. No, that would be cool. I yeah. would like now that I because I was gonna say uh, Tenzon would have been fun back in the day. Tenzon can't move anymore, but Kojima still moves pretty good. So yes, yeah, Kojima, Kojima could still have a hell of a match. He was yes. just recently the GHC champion. Yes, he was. Yeah, it's full circle, man. Full circle. Yeah. No, uh, Kojima versus PCO. That would rule. Everybody, go to uh, Daily Motion and look up Satoshi Kojima versus uh, Tenru from 2002 All Japan. Ooh. For a triple crown championship, Oof. uh, amazing match. Everybody. Yes, sir. I just want I my my cousin has a Plex server and he has just like old like classic matches on there, random. So I could just scroll through there. I'm like, I've I've never seen that before. So I just clicked on clicked on that match and just popped right up. And pff, damn, it was good. That's uh, a cool part of being a wrestling. Match. I say that's a cool part of being a wrestling fan. There's just always going to be a match that you've never seen. Yeah, yeah. There's just too much to watch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, it's impossible to catch it all. Yeah. Uh, next we had Rhino. Uh, oh, sorry, I skipped over. Uh, Alexander was backstage. He asked Rich Swan to be his partner at Sacrifice against the Time Machines, uh, and then Steve Macklin walked up and offered to be a third. I immediately rolled my fucking eyes because I was like, "Are we really gonna do? Um, can they coexist?" But uh, Alexander was like, "No, that's a dumb idea because you want to beat my ass." And he goes, "And plus, we already have a third, and it's Frankie Kazarian." And Macklin looked slightly insulted. <laughs> like but Macklin. No, see, it's Go like ahead. the No Homers Club. Yes, sorry. Yeah, M Macklin's reasoning is because he wanted to do a scouting report, and Alexander was like, "Dude, I've been the champion for a year. You don't know who I am by now. That's enough scouting report. You don't need to be my partner for that." And I was like, "You know what? You sons of bitches are making some sense. <laughs> like, like, I'm not used to this on Impact." Show's dumb, but Josh is the smartest man in wrestling. <laughs> yeah. And then next we go to another uh, not good match, but I'm going to give them a pass and I'll tell you why it's Rhino versus Sammy Callahan. So um, this was a makeup match because Callahan had just injured you, Yua, Yui Mora. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so they threw, they threw Rhino into it. I don't think either one of these guys was in their right mind to wrestle. You and Mora ended up being okay. It just seemed like their heart wasn't really in this match. That's, and I, I maybe maybe because I knew that ahead of time, maybe that's why like I I could see that in them. Had I not known that going in, I probably wouldn't have noticed that. But um, yeah, I I just I kind of was like ah, uh, that sucks. But they did not have a really good match. I did not know that, and I thought Ugh, this is bad. So yeah, uh, big con hit Callahan with a chair. <laughs> and more step six of uh, the design is over. Step seven's coming up soon. Who gives a shit? Sammy but, Callahan uh, is the dumbest fucker on this show. I feel like he's doing a long con. Get it, con? But what uh, is it and why? What is it and why? What I'm what's gonna the let point? these guys beat the shit out of me for three months <laughs> so I can finally get my revenge. That's my Sammy impression. Yeah. Um, it's a dumb. It's if this is if this is Sammy's version of four dimensional <laughs> chess, uh, he's got CTE. Yeah. This well, is a terrible plan. Everybody's like, well, at least it's a story. Well, just because it's a story doesn't mean it's a good story, guys. It's not credit, a good story. I'll credit someone with it's. I don't know if it's a good story, but I mean, like, because you don't know how good a story is until you're finished with it. I'm not happy with Act One or Act Two. I'll tell no. you that right now. <laughs> I'm not a fan of the motivations. I mean, that's the problem with the story is the character motivations are unclear and kind of weak, right? Yeah. So there in itself makes for a bad story. Just because like they're telling a story doesn't mean it's go well. They're they're trying. Well, okay, they're professionals. Yeah. They have yeah. a television show. They should C be congrats. trying. Congrats on doing the bare minimum, guys. I appreciate That's it. That's how I feel about yeah. this storyline. It doesn't. <laughs> it is not working. Yeah. Speaking of not working, Dango and Santino Morello were backstage, and Trey Miguel walked up complaining about not being booked on No Surrender. And Morello talked about an X Division match for No for Sacrifice featuring 
several. And uh, so he talked about the multiverse match. Uh, and then Johnny Swinger was pushed into the shot by Zicky Dice on his little cart. Um, and he had a and he had a measuring tape attempting to find a tomato can. Uh, and he said, "You're a little bit bigger than Sky Low Low. What do you think?" And then uh, Miguel threatened, and uh, he threatened him, and he backed down, which was pretty funny. Swinger then asked Dango to do the job for him. Dango said the only job he was there to do was the assistant dictator of authority. Um, mostly pretty bad highlights. Johnny Swinger, of course, Johnny Swinger. And I thought Trey Miguel was pretty good in the segment too. Trey, um, Trey's good at dumb shit. I'll say this: yeah, when when it comes <laughs> to acting like an idiot, Trey Miguel is really good at it. I'm not insulting Trey, but he plays like um, he plays goofy very very well. Unlike Dango, who is terrible. It's always been terrible. <laughs> continues to be terrible. Always will be terrible. Not sure why he has a job in this company. Is not in fact better than QT Marshall. <laughs> I might have said that one to get under your skin a little bit. Yeah. Success, <laughs> sir. Success. <laughs> Success. Uh, and then next we go to, uh, uh, I don't know, Jordan Grace. Sorry. I don't know why I, I read that as Gracie, but it's Grace. I don't know why I read that as Gracie. <laughs> like she's Italian. Well, Jordan well, it's just Jordan. Well, because it's Jordan Grace defeating Alex Gracia, but I was like oh. conflating both of the names into Gracie for some reason. Um, but it was a it was a quick squash. Dude, Jordan Grace looks tremendous. Yes. <laughs> she's like she's got that bodybuilding show coming she's up. Shredded. And I was like, Jesus, shredded, man. She's shredded. I've heard Alex Grassi is gonna be good for like a long time, and I've yet to see it. Wasn't she in AEW for a little bit? She used to she was doing the dark jobs and stuff like that. Okay. Like, yeah, she's been around for a while, but for a I while. Was... That's why I keep like those fight things. Oh, she's gonna be around. She's getting better. And I'm like, is she like I'm seeing this for like two years now? She's getting better, and I don't see it ever. Who, who's who's keep saying that? Is you? Oh, said I read it like Fightful. Someone was saying. Oh, that, like, okay. One of those people. Okay. Yeah, maybe she's the source. Who knows? No, um, no yeah. Um, lots of Scorpio Sky stories coming out over there. Funny how that works out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then Moose walked up to Joe Hendry telling a story, and he said uh, with joy. Um, and that dancing moose had arrived, and then the the people that were surrounding Hendry started chanting "Dancing Moose." So Moose naturally starts to beat the shit out of Joe Hendry because Myers had attacked him from behind. Uh, moose and Myers uh, beat him down. I don't know where they're going with this, but I I thought this was entertaining. I like I like these guys. So. If a bunch of people were singing "Dancing Moose" to me, I would also beat the shit out of everybody in front of me. <laughs> so in this moment, Moose became the most relatable character in the history of professional wrestling. And I would, yes, kill all of these people. They're irritating. Yeah, uh, Bullet Club are backstage with their titles, including Kenta. They, they walked up to Josh Alexander, Swan, and Kazarian, who challenged them to a six-man match for next week. Um, the gist of it is they they challenged them, saying they. For Kazarian basically challenged them, saying that, hey, we got a big match coming up at Sacrifice and we need to get some practice. And uh, the Bullet Club were highly insulted by that, to which they should be insulted. As they, sh <laughs> as they should be. You just called Kenta a job guy. Now he's going to kick it, your face in. Well, not only that, Kenta is the, the uh, strong openweight champion and the, the Bullet Club are the tag team champions of Impact. And uh, so Kazarian was kind of being a little bit of a dick, <laughs> but I, I, I like the segment. It worked out. Um, I'm looking forward to the match. So it's not, it's not unfrankie like to be a dick though. The no. vast majority of Beth swaths of his career, Frankie's been a dickhead. So kind of yeah. fits. Uh, and the next we, we got probably the, well, not probably it was the, the best match of the night. It was a uh, Kushida defeating Jonathan Gresham. So, uh, JD, do you like 1970s wrestling, like it, like from NWA? Not really, to be honest. No. With you. Well, this okay. was two guys like exchanging yeah. uh, holds and grappling and submission maneuvers, um, and uh, but then they it was a lot faster, obviously, because they only had like ten minutes to do a lot of the stuff. <clears throat> so a lot of like moves and counter moves and and stuff like that. I I really I I did dig it. The crowd, I don't think the crowd knew what to make of the match. Um, and then, all, like, Kushida just tapped him out with a hoverboard lock quick. Like, it just, out of nowhere. And the reason why they did that is I understand the psychology immediately is because they're trying to get over the hoverboard lock because he's got the match against Josh coming up. And, in fact, at Battle in the Valley a couple weeks ago, 
uh, Kushida put on the hoverboard lock onto Josh and he held it after the bell was over. So they're trying to get over that this is a super dangerous move that can make you tap out quick. And so uh, Gresham uh, tapped out pretty, pretty, he tapped out right away as soon as it was applied. But uh, I thought it was a pretty strong match. I didn't love it. Um, I do think it was, it was very Dory Funk, right? Yeah. It was very Dory Funk, worked at like um, two thirds or like two and a third speed, right? It was, it was like a faster moving version, like you said, from the 70s. <clears throat> yeah. I don't know. Like, um, I didn't love it, but I mean, like, I do like what they're going with. I do. I think it's just probably a little too short and they're trying to get too much shit in and too, too tight a time period. You know, yeah, I felt like I they agree. were just trying to get too much in rather than just using the confines of the match. As soon as I feel like Gresham feels the need to do all these counters and stuff like that, because it's just what he does. Right. And I feel like Kushida was working a Gresham match more than Kushida was just doing Kushida stuff because Kushida can do a lot. Like Kushida is pretty versatile with what he does. Yeah. Um, I do like the idea of getting over the hoverboard lock because legitimately it's a Kimura. Kimura, yeah. fuck your elbow up, man. That's a oh legit, my gosh. That's a legit <laughs> dangerous <laughs> yes. move. And he's really good at working because this a lot of Kimuras look just terrible. His look good. Like his look mm -hmm. really good. It looks like you mess you up. So uh like CM Punk's Americana always look just like ass. Like that yeah. ain't hurting anybody. But like uh because she just looks good. So I think the 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 focus of the match was work worked for me. Uh, the work style wasn't wasn't my thing. I saw Frank Mir, um, ju American Jiu Jitsu guy mm -hmm. out of Vegas. He uh, he fought man who, uh, Antonio... man who beat Brock Lesnar. Yes, he fe he he uh, he fought Antonio Rodrigo Nogueira, one of the greatest BJJ guys in all of MMA history. Mm -hmm. uh, and he got him in a Kimura and literally like rolled him over, flipped him over, and then got him in a position, and he broke his arm and his shoulder at the same time because Nogueira one of the greatest jujitsu guys of all time. He's not tapping out to a white guy. Sorry, brother. You broke, you broke your shit. One of the most vicious things I've ever seen in MMA. Uh, it was, it was wild. If you don't watch, if you have no background in combat sports or <laughs> don't know MMA, you would take what Mike said to be like questionably offensive, but he is 100% correct. <laughs> no, he, 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 he wasn't about to tap out. He to wasn't going to tap. There, no, no, not a chance. No, Brazilian no. guys not going to do that. They, you will have to no. kill them. It's too, it's too much pride. Oh, it's too much national pride. 100%. I mean, and that's that's not even like that's not no, even, it's like, you accurate. could be offensive. You could be offended if you want to, but that's just the accurate. way it was. No, one hundred percent accurate. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like, if you don't know combat yeah. sports, you'd be like, "Ooh, yeah. I don't know about that. That sounds questionable." No, a Brazilian, especially back then when the Brazilians were selling the idea that mm -hmm. our jujitsu is in fact the best form of jujitsu. It is the most powerful martial art on the planet, and you're not going to beat me with what they because they because uh, forever the, the Kimura was double wrist lock. Right. And yeah. they rebranded it the Kimura. Mm -hmm. And uh so yeah, they weren't gonna tap out to one of their moves. Snap. <laughs> yeah. Snap. Snap. <laughs> and then that was over. Yeah. Frank Weir, dangerous dude. Yep. Uh Eddie Edwards was seen driving out to the desert. So there you go. Next we got Killer Kelly came down to the ring holding a mic. Uh Kelly called out Taylor Wilde. Whew. And that's where this whole show just fell off a cliff. <laughs> it was struggling I was, before. Watch that entrance was great. Yeah, That's yeah, and then uh, and then witch a woman came out and she's talked about some witchy stuff, and then she pulled out some tarot cards. I don't know what the hell was going on. It was bad. Taylor Wilde's one of the worst actors in wrestling. Uh, but Kylan King came out and hit Kelly with a chair. So there you go. Now they're a tag team called the Coven. You know why I get mad about people bitching like oh, QT Marshall helped uh, Hobbs win a title because I watch. Taylor Wilde every week on my TV. <laughs> and people say, well, this was just terrible. I'm like, you don't watch Taylor Wilde play with tarot cards during Wait, a match. Like, you don't know what terrible is yet, brother. You Wait till you is. see this. <laughs> yeah, this is shit. Don't tell me what's bad wrestling when I have to watch Taylor Wilde and can do nothing yeah. about it. And I want to like her. I want yeah. to like Taylor Wilde, but she makes it so hard. No. It's so bad. This, this is not. It's not good, man. No, it's really um, bad. It's really bad. <laughs> At least we have another tag team now because we're losing one, right? Yeah, we, we just lost have... one, but gained a new one. Yeah. So we do. We lose a tag team. We get their non-union equivalent <laughs> pop and just take up space. Uh, they, uh. they they cut away to PCO hitting a rock with a shovel. So there you go. Uh, Killer Kelly is backstage. She's pretty upset. And then the Death Dolls teleported into the scene saying that witches can't be trusted. Well, I, I believe them there. Uh, Rosemary and Kelly was an expert in killing people, but underwear of the dark realm. Rosemary called Taylor Wilde a charlatan and then said they would help her. Kelly politely refused. Um, 
Uh, Wild and King then show up and said they were going to continue to practice the dark arts. And Jessica got excited about magic tricks. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm sorry. Rosemary then said that they put the knockouts tag titles on the line. If Wild and King lose, they have to stop practicing magic. <laughs> What the fuck are we watching, man? What the fuck uh, is this shit? Like and then Val uh, Valkyrie and uh, Valkyrie and Jessica saying witches get stitches. That made me laugh. I legitimately <laughs> laughed out loud when they said that, and I was embarrassed and ashamed uh, to be a man when they said yeah. that. <laughs> I still laugh. You know, that. you know, Josiah, who wrote this recap uh, for the Wrestling Observer, he is like an educated guy. Right, he's a pastor. A I'm embarrassed for him for having to to write this. <laughs> like he's like a well-educated guy. He works in the church and he does wrestling as a side hustle, and then he has to type this stuff. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he said that he liked the witches get stitches part. Uh, the it's best, funny. But, it's a uh, good line. Yeah, it's a good <laughs> yes. line. The rest of this was some of the worst shit I've seen on this on a on a show that does some questionable shit from time to time. <laughs> Yes. This is one of the worst things I've yeah. ever seen them do. But reading reading the recap was pretty fun. I got it. Oh, I, I admit, yeah, I got the notes too, and I cracked up reading Joe Sides. So kudos uh, to you, my Canadian friend. Yeah, PCO and Eddie Edwards had a fight in the desert with cinematic music. Uh, PCO was basically like threw him into like a pit, and it was about to bury him alive. But then he got hit with a car, um, and so now we're gonna do who ran him over. And uh, the first, that was the first name that obviously pops up is Rikishi because he ran over Stone Cold Steve Austin. Um, I think they're going to try to make everybody believe that it's Davey Richards, but it's going to end up being Alicia Edwards. That's my, that's Mike's guess, but who knows? No, I think it's going to be Rikishi. I'm serious. Because Rik- <laughs> yeah. that's what we do. We bring back old garbage that WWE is done with. <laughs> so we're going to bring Rikishi in as the guy who ran him over. Uh, I, I would actually pop more if it was Rikishi than Alicia Edwards. I got to tell you, but I, it would make I, as I'm much hold- sense. I'm holding out hope that it's uh, Davy Richards, but who knows, man? Sure. Um, Doesn't matter. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, Deanna Praza joined commentary team for the main event, and I thought the main event was uh, was pretty good. Um, yeah. I, I I did dig the main event. Just um, just couldn't save the show. Um, but uh, Knockouts champion Mickey James defeated Giselle Shaw. Um, there was some interference, but for, mother, for the most part, it was a pretty good match. Um, Deanna Prazo ended up helping uh, Mickey – because uh, Shaw and uh, Savannah Evans and Jai Vidal had basically cheated, and Mickey was rolled up uh, for the Mickey got rolled up by Giselle Shaw. Prazo ran in and flipped him over. The referee was being distracted, and then we got the one, two, three. Um, but uh, that was the show. That was the main event. Looks like we're gonna get some more of Giselle Shaw and uh, Deanna Prazo at Sacrifice. Cool. I don't know who's gonna win that. Legitimately, I legitimately don't know who's gonna win that match. Uh, well, I mean, Giselle won the first one, so. You know, and that's why she got the title shot tonight. So maybe Peraza gets the second one. Who knows? But I don't know. So uh, Josiah sent us a message, and he wanted me to read oh. this verbatim. And because Please. he does, uh, and because he does us a favor by sending us the recap before it even gets posted to the Observer, mm-hmm. I wanted to to do him this favor. He said, "Final thoughts." So this is like Jerry Springer. Final thoughts. This had to be one of the most missable episodes of Impact I've ever seen since I started recapping the show weekly. There was some really bad stuff on this one, along with two good matches in Gresham and Kushida and Sean James. If you have to pick one thing to watch, make it Gresham Kushida. Otherwise, skip the rest of the rest or settle for my recap. So he, he wanted me to read that verbatim, and uh, I, I I tend to agree. Um, honestly, like you don't have to watch a single minute of this show. <laughs> this man, this man's a pastor, and yeah. Impact has pushed him to this breaking point. This is a man whose life revolves around having faith. Yeah. And, and he's starting to lose it in impact. Yes, yes, he is. Keep your faith in the Lord. Do not put it in impact because they will always let you down. Every single <laughs> every time. Single, every single time. Man, they were on a good roll, man. The, but then this week, this week was not not good. Not Last good week was all. good. Last week was yeah. good. Yeah. Last week was really good. Next week looks pretty good too. So um Looks like we got uh, Gresham and Bailey versus uh, Decay. Should be pretty be good. Fun. Steve Macklin, Steve Macklin and Heath, uh, Death Dolls in the Coven. But then Bullet Club uh, versus Josh Alexander, Rich Swan, and Frankie Kazarian. That's good. what. That's gonna that's, be good. that's that's what we got on tap for next week. But hey, if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or um, watching us on YouTube, head over to 
patreon.com slash fight game media. Um, we, we kind of already spilled the beans on all the impact news. I just kind of started the show with that, trying something new. But uh, if you want to talk about the wrestling world news with Mike and JD, we got, uh, we got lots of stuff to talk about. we got some Vince McMahon news. JD's got a little bit of inside knowledge on Vince McMahon's status within the company. Um, uh, WWE sale news, MLW's lawsuit against WWE, Brian Cage, uh, FTR, uh, Sari, and much, much more. So head over to patreon.com slash fight game media where Mike and JD talk about the wrestling world news.